to church is a big issue in today's culture. Did you know there's a decline in men that attend church on a regular basis, either with or without their families? Thank God there are people that are out there studying that and coming up with programs to address that. Pastor Mark Lubbock is with us today and he has a passion for men's ministries and he travels the world sharing how to do effective men's ministries and how to get men back in the church as leaders of their family. Not only that, he struggled with addiction and he's going to talk about how that shaped who he was as a man in church. We are so excited to have you back on Life on Purpose TV. Today's episode, we have Pastor Mark Lubbock. He has many hats that he wears. You'll get a fun chance to hear about those today. But he is a husband. He is a father. He is the CEO of Gulf South Men. He has so much to say about our culture and how we can impact men. But let's kind of start with the little man inside you. Talk about your early life. You're the oldest of seven kids. That's right. That had to be just a whole lot of fun. You know, growing up was a lot of fun and uh, we had pretty normal life. Uh, my father was an engineer. Uh, he was a marine reservist and uh, when we were nine, uh, dad went to a, a boot camp. He was the drill instructor there and uh, came back and the day after he came back, uh, we went to exercise his hobby, which was ham radio and pick up a used antenna to erect in the backyard. And that's when my life changed, and it, it was one of the most significant changes that uh, led to a, a discovery, exploration, disaster, and trouble. Erecting the antenna in the backyard um, put us in a position where I was holding wires with my younger brother and my father holding the pole. It got too close to a high power line. 770 volts arced over, and it, it killed my father on the spot and gave me third degree burns, hospitalizing me. Fortunately, my younger brother was not hurt at all. The electricity came in through the palm of each hand, burnt the palms black, and went through my body and came out of both feet, burning holes in a circle around my feet. Oh my and uh, so it was uh, something I had to recover from. I got gangrene as a result and uh, had some life experiences no nine-year-old should ever have. And I recall uh, my uncle, coming to kind of give me guidance after that, still walking on crutches, head to toe amputated. And he told me at this point, I'm now the man of the house. I'm the oldest of, of uh, six surviving kids. The seventh had, had died sadly as a baby, Eric. And he told me I needed to take care of my mother and my brothers and my sisters. And you're nine? I'm nine years old. Uh, my mother at the time had a, a sixth grade education and was a stay at home mother. And we had no life insurance or anything, and so from that point forward, uh, there was a little bit of a struggle. She learned that you had to take care of yourself. You never asked for help, and passed that on to us. I took pretty seriously the responsibility of being the oldest in the house, and I did my best using whatever available standard I had to influence the family. And what I learned is you take care of yourself, you work very, very hard, and you work hard to succeed. And so we passed that on to all the kids, and that became my mantra. The stress was pretty significant. Uh, we had no male figures in our life. Grandfathers had passed away. There were no uncles uh, that were alive living nearby. And so there, my mother was working. I was gonna say, so you went from a perfectly functioning household, mother, father in place, to your mom's a single mom, and she has to go to work. So everything changed all at once. It did, and so I actually started working and was doing weekend jobs fairly frequently, doing a number of things, working at the ballpark, selling frosty malts. Uh, the pressure though was pretty strong, and the pressure to grow up was strong, and culture at that time was in a turmoil. It was the love era, and it uh, uh, you look to the people in the media for influence. And so I tried to imitate them. I, I tried a cigarette, decided that wasn't gonna work for me. Uh, but I tried alcohol, and by the time I was 14, I was regularly drinking and buying alcohol. And that was part of my life uh, all the way up into my 20s. I got involved in work, I became successful, and really had a goal of, of trying to have a prestigious job that would pay me a lot of money so I could provide well for my family. Take care of yourself. Uh, that's right. And uh, along the way, the alcohol became a very serious problem. And uh, I, I reached the point where I got uh, arrested for uh, drunk driving, DUI, and uh, actually quit drinking and uh, was able to do that. I got engaged with AA for a while and uh, 
focus back on work again. Along the way, I met a really great lady who had uh, twins, a boy and a girl, young, they were six at the time, and we married. She found the church. I liked what it was doing for the children, so I joined, and I even went every now and then, and uh, very generously, I'd put a dollar in a plate every once in a great while. <laughs> Felt pretty proud about that. But I really didn't understand. I had no clue that I needed a relationship with Jesus. And I didn't know what it looked like to be a Christian in my walk. I worked very, very hard. And that affected my marriage. As I said, I married a great lady. Uh, but the marriage ultimately ended in divorce. And so I coped with the alcohol. And also, I felt very awkward socially. And that seemed to ease the uh, pain just a little bit. Got another DWI. And it was, a, it was a significant event. And sitting in that jail cell, and I spent the night in jail, I finally decided that I needed to give up and give in to this God, whoever or whatever. And I didn't know how to pray at that point, so I said the Lord's Prayer, but I, I prayed it. I didn't say it that time. And I made the determination that irrespective of how my life turned out from that point forward, things didn't look too good. I thought I'd lose my job and probably my future. I made the decision that I was going to lean on God and learn what that meant. Fast forward, I uh, was invited by a neighbor to attend a men's Bible study. And they eventually, they bought me my first Bible, started teaching me how to read it. I learned how to pray through the group. It took me a full year to have the courage to pray out loud. And along the way, I had met a lady, Vicki, who is now my wife. As a man, I didn't see tools and resources in the churches that I visited, in my church, that would have prevented my divorce. I certainly didn't see anything that showed me how to live successfully, joyfully, as I really wanted to. In fact, I learned that most of the men that I knew had a facade. I certainly had a facade. I wanted to appear confident and successful. Inside, I was very insecure and unhappy and fearful. I learned eventually that I wasn't alone. Many men also struggle with this. I dug into studying the Bible and learning how to be a disciple and what does it mean to be saved. I did give my life to Jesus and I did determine that I wanted to be a disciple. I wanted to follow in his footsteps. But along the way, quite a few people asked me if I've ever considered uh, preaching or becoming a pastor. <laughs> I honestly thought that was the worst job that a human being could have. And so I, I laugh frequently when they suggest that. But I prayed, and as I prayed, uh, I began to sense that that might be where God was leading me. Parallel to that, uh, Vicki was still staying in contact with me and I, her. And uh, I asked my small group to pray every day with me. I was not going to marry until I knew that I could make it last forever, that this was the lady that God chose for me and me for her. Uh, so I did propose and uh, I let Vicki know that uh, Christ was going to be in the center of everything. Uh, a, a quick testimony of how I wanted to start the marriage but didn't. I wanted to start on day one praying with her at the end of the day. <laughs> I got chicken. I was scared about what she might think. And so I didn't do it. Uh, I thought the next night I'm going to do it, and I chickened out again. The third night, I pressed ahead. I took her hand by the bedside. We kneeled, and I said a really great prayer. I had some these and thous in there, and uh, you know, some real Old Testament language. And uh, didn't mean a thing I said. I was really trying to impress her. Later, I learned how to talk to God. But that became a center point of our life. And that also became a focus for my ministry. I understood that as a man, I had to get my spiritual life right to be the husband that she deserved. What I didn't understand at that time was the better job I did, the better my marriage got. And that, as I stepped into formal ministry, called to be a pastor, colored the way that I perceived my ministry forward. And I began looking at my congregation and how many families were led by a man who was totally sold out to Jesus, who loved Jesus so much that he would sacrifice everything for his family. And so I wanted to see what was necessary to reach these men and light that fire. And I came to understand that the general church offers little to nothing. There's not a single seminary in the nation that I'm aware of that has any classes or focus on how do you reach men for Jesus? How do you connect them at their point of pain their point of need, 
and lead them along to where they can successfully be a fruitful husband, a great father, but also a great citizen, a great member of the kingdom of God, active in the church and in the community, in the workplace, everywhere they go, where their conversation drips with references to their life in Jesus. I didn't see seminaries turning out any training. Worse, I didn't see any churches that were successful in implementing a process. Dr. Pat Morley says it this way. He says, your process is perfectly designed to deliver the results you're getting. If the outcome is not favorable, the process needs to be changed. I began sensing a call that would pull me out of the pulpit to focus on coming alongside the church and to resourcing for men those tools that would successfully engage them with Jesus. Uh, we went to a Promise Keeper event in Texas. When I say we, there was a group of people who were active servants trying to facilitate men's ministry. And we got a call that said that the volunteer crew in Texas had not shown up and they needed help for this Promise Keeper event. We had experienced people, we'd done two events here in Baton Rouge, so we agreed to be the team for Promise Keepers. It went off without a hitch. It was a standing room only crowd. On the way back we determined that what was necessary and needed was some kind of a local organization that could take these excited men and equip them through the local church. And that's how my ministry, current ministry, Gulf South Men was founded. I uh, was the founder of it among other men. I became the CEO and remain that today. And worked very hard to identify best practices, tools and resources that not only uh, connect men to Jesus, but help them overcome life problems. I envision it this way, that when a couple get married, they connect. And they overlap, they complement one another. And as they start moving forward, they'll hit an obstacle. It might be the size of a pebble, tiny. But to them, it stops all forward motion. And they never truly become what the Bible says, which is to cleave together as one, unless they find a way to work through those problems. The church, try as it might, doesn't do a consistent good job of helping. And men don't ask for help. Most pastors will tell you, they never have a man knocking on the door asking to start a men's ministry. Ladies will automatically start a very successful ministry and, and go on to make it prosperous, but the men sit in silence. I've watched marriages that were destroyed to the point of divorce be healed and mended. I've watched children come to their parents and say, since daddy changed, our families become good and fun again. And what did these men do to make that transition from one to the other? You know, that's an important question, and it's a process that takes time. They begin meeting together and forming relationships of trust, first and foremost. With other men? With other men. The dynamic works. There is a, an appropriate time for men and women to be segregated. Men will reveal things one to another and share deep innermost shame and secrets that they'll never share in a mixed uh, group. So these relationships have to be formed and trust has to be built. That takes time. Then they need to, as they're willing and able, to be led along a process where they learn the Word of God, but also learn how to apply it to their life. Practical things, talking about things like forgiveness, about guilt, about shame, about moving beyond the past into the future, about hope, about the belief that not only can your life change, but it can become something really good. Say a man would watch this and hear you saying, go get your spiritual self so that you're stronger, so that when life throws things at you, you're better prepared to deal with it as a husband, a father. Where would they go to start that process if they're not by a Gulf South men? You know, we were available on the internet and so I always encourage people to try to contact us for two reasons. If we don't have the resource or an answer, we're connected to people who do. When I said we uh, promote best practices, we identify things that work and ministries that work. We do originate some content and some training, but we're uh, very enthused to partner with others who do things well. We can put them into contact with local uh, groups if they happen not to be near one of the Gulf South men venues. And we try to cover from Alabama to Texas. 
uh, but we're also connected with other men's organizations. There are so many things Mark Lubbock is doing to help get men into church. He's involved with Promise Keepers. He's involved with Iron Sharpens Iron. He's involved with United Methodist Men. He pastors every week. Would you like to see him be able to go and continue to minister to men and also talk about men in the pulpits overcoming addictions? Go to lifeonpurpose.tv to support Mark's ministry.